Hey, so, uh, hi. Hi, Dan. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you feeling? Well, I'm, uh, I, I have restless body syndrome today. Uh, I have, I took my panic medicine about 15 minutes ago. So okay. So we'll see how long it takes to kick in. But mm-hmm. uh, I just wanted to start this episode by saying thank you uh, to everybody who responded so positively to the depression episode that we did. Um, I was hoping that we would be able to reach people who needed to hear a frank and personal discussion of mental health, and and uh, we, we did, and that's great. And so many of you have emailed me and texted me and other things uh, to lend support and to talk about some of your own stories, and I think that's wonderful. Um, I want to share very quickly, because I know I'm in a geek audience, uh, one thing that has helped me a lot, Okay. So I had, I think this was right before the episode aired, and a very good friend of mine had not heard um, what was going on. Do you remember Kenna? She used to work for you. Uh Yeah. She was my assistant for a while. She worked for you for a while. Now she Mm -hmm. has a real job somewhere. Uh, Anyway, I was in a Discord with her for my League of Legends team and mentioned that my panic had been really bad, and she hadn't heard it. And so... I was trying to explain, oh yeah, I have a panic disorder now in a funny way. And the way that I said it was, I got nerfed in the last patch. And yay for me telling a funny joke. But more importantly than that, that was the the sudden ramifications of that, like just roared through my brain. And that was the first time that I had ever seen my mental health as a temporary condition that could be changed rather than a sign of ongoing and irreversible degradation. Mm. The idea that I got nerfed in this patch because I was clearly OP, uh, and then I could potentially be buffed in another patch, like that's a concept (laughs) that my therapist has been trying to get across to me for a while. But it wasn't until the video game metaphor that it clicked in my brain and I believed it. That's hilarious. Yeah. I love that. So everyone out there who's been nerfed, it's because you were OP. They needed to make some balance changes. You're going to be buffed at some point. It might not be the next patch, but it's coming. We're all going to be way overpowered at some point. I mean, sometimes they nerf things when they're not, oh, you know. Yeah. Like they, they, the whims of the developers. Mm-hmm. They just decide that mm-hmm. for the new environment, they need to change the way that yep. this gun works or this mm-hmm. champion works. Whatever. Anyway. So, uh, well, we appreciate everybody's kind words. Yeah. It was very nice. It's a read great comment section. Uh, yeah. You're supposed to never read the comments, but mm-hmm. uh, that was a very good week for comments. All right. I. Have a food heist for you. Okay, we'll do that. Then we'll talk about our brackets because we have oh. a, a fun week for brackets. Okay, first I'm I'm going to uh, tease the food heist and then let's do brackets. Oh, okay. And then let's do the food heist later. Okay. So uh, the this food heist is eight years old. Okay. And the fact that I am just now hearing about it mm-hmm. is absolutely criminal. So uh, this food heist yeah. is third grade, second grade. <laughs> <laughs> Eight year old. Yeah, it is at this point now old enough to, uh, I don't know, to sneak my keys out of my nightstand and steal my car in the middle of the night, which is a thing my eight year old did once. I don't think he was old enough to do that. He just <laughs> did it. Uh, I will tell you as a tease that it took place in Florida at oh. a Wendy's. Ooh. And now we'll talk about brackets Wait, a for a Wendy's while. Wendy's food heist? Yeah, okay, it, it, it's a technically a food heist okay. at the barest level, but you're going to love it. Okay. And it is worth it. You're going to love it. All right, okay. well, our brackets. So first off, let's talk a little bit about where we are, because this is our last week on round two. Ooh. So we have done all of the Sweet 16, mm-hmm. and now we are on the Elite Eight, um, and... We are almost through the Elite Eight, where we ha- will have our final four on each side. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And there's been big upsets. This, this week, uh, I announced it already on my, mm-hmm. um, on my weekly update, but there were some enormous upsets um, because um, Do Not Steal the King's Potatoes at a 12 seed. 
mm-hmm. out of 16, has defeated the Spanish wine he- heist, soon to be a major motion picture. Not anymore. Not anymore. Not if it's it loses. Not- yeah. Um, so our, our 12 seed has moved on uh, to the final four. Nice. Pretty cool. That's they, great. The uh, Snackaderms did get defeated by the Gator Gourmands. If anyone is going to beat the Snackaderms, mm-hmm. it would have to be the Gator Gourmands. I mean, you had the Gator Gourmands as the number one seed. Yeah. And the Snackaderms as the number nine. It's not an upset. It is, uh, you know, already um, the Snackaderms have done well. They were a nine versus mm-hmm. an eight. They did win to get to the Elite Eight. But um, so right now, we. Um, on the uh, the other side, we don't have any big upsets winning. Uh, everything is going about as I seeded them. So, for the bad story for ideas. For the bad story ideas. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, our last of the Elite Eight. We want you to vote on Vikings versus Cthulhu, which is one, Ooh. which is our number three seed, versus Free Fall Burrito World. Free Fall Burrito World. Free Fall Burrito World. Um as uh, to, to get us to our last of the final four on the bad story ideas. Okay. Only um, one of those can leave the arena. Yep. Um, that's that's going to be a rough one. That is a rough one. Because uh, Vic- Vikings versus, versus Cthulhu is, you know, it just... It's the most metal shirt that yeah. we could make. But Free Fall Burrito World is really <laughs> weird, and people like really weird t-shirts. Yes. Um, and so... Uh, just a t-shirt that says free fall burrito world. And it's like some dude plunging through the seven layers, mm-hmm. um, is, uh, is a thing. Yep. Um, these, these, these weirdos. House plunging through the layers. What's that? Maybe a house plunging oh, yeah. through the layers mm-hmm. like yeah. in, uh, Wizard of Oz. <laughs> um, and on the food heist, we also have a pretty hard one. We have the great maple syrup heist. Ooh. Which was your number three seed, mm-hmm. and that's like your favorite of all that's, time. That's one of the greatest. Uh, versus pure illegal butter. Pure illegal butter guarantee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so we'll have the links to the original discussions, um, as always, in case you've maybe forgotten over the weeks which is which. Uh, and then we will have our final four. We won't know when we come back next week <laughs> to record because we're actually going to record that right after this. Yeah. So it will be back in. A week or so, uh, we'll maybe know by then. No, we probably won't even know. So there'll be yeah. a couple, a couple of episodes. Time, time moves in a very strange way for yeah. us. Right. We record when we Here can record. In podcast land. Mm-hmm. Well, let's do the the food heist. And then I'll tell people what I'm signing. All right. So uh, this one is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one was sent to us by Alert Reader Gary Honda. Thank you very much for sending this in. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was eight years ago. In Florida, in Loxahatchee, Florida, Uh there was a man who at 1.20 in the morning, Joshua James, 24 years old, drove up to a Wendy's, ordered a soft drink, and they gave it to him, Uh and then instead of paying, he threw a live alligator through the window (laughs) and drove away. (laughs) This is the only food heist we've ever been sent where instead of talking to the police, they talk to the, like, Fish and Wildlife Administration. Well, I guess it counts as a heist because he had an accomplice. Yeah. And he would obviously planned Mm -hmm. uh, ahead of time. And so he and the gator just decided they're going to get this soft drink for free. Um, It doesn't sound like he planned it very far in advance uh because he later told the police that he just found the alligator on the side of the road and he put it in his truck. And so at some point driving around, the two of them concocted this plan. And the alligator's Mm -hmm. like, okay, but what's my role? And he's like, oh, you're the distraction. Yep. And so the man was charged with assault with a deadly weapon. You're kidding. No. Okay. Assault with a deadly weapon um, without intent to kill. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, illegally possessing an alligator and petty theft. Well, those do seem like the three things. Do you think... (laughs) He's got to be related to the Gator Gourmands. I mean, one must assume. Gator Gourmands like to eat the alligators, right? Like, yeah. they were alligator I, I, ranchers. Well, that's, that's what we 
assumed was going to happen. I was about mm-hmm. to say hoped would happen. I don't want people to eat a cute alligator. My th- problem is that I don't remember the timing. Because uh-huh. I remember the Gator Gourmands happened during a hurricane. Oh, right. But was it far enough ago? No, no, no. This is what it is. This is the, the beginning of the life of crime of the Gator Gourmands. Oh. This is eight years. This is the prequel. This is when the alligator got out of prison. Uh-huh. And now he was hardened by life on the inside. Mm-hmm. And he went back to his friends. He's like, all right, guess what? So were you, are you saying the Gator Gourmands are... Gators? I think... Because I was going to say this guy who threw the gators, like gator-related crime. Gator-related crime? Mm, I will become the... Well, it it might be both, Mm. you know? He, now he's got a taste for crime, and he, you know, has his Batman villain calling card of gator-related crime. Yep. And then once his buddy got out of prison, he had been able to talk on the inside, Mm -hmm. make some connections, learn some valuable intel, and then the two of them worked together... And went to, I think, Louisiana is where the Gator Gourmands happened. So there we are. Yeah. That so. is that is spectacular. Uh, yeah. What'd you say the person who sent that to you was? His name is Gary Honda. Gary. I assume close relative of E Honda from yeah. Street Fighter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and <laughs> this is the kind of crime where, as I was describing it to the people out in the lobby when we were waiting to come in and record, mm-hmm. they said, Oh, so this was in Florida, right? <laughs> so, well, yes. Well, you know. I uh, I went to Florida for a convention, and yes. my kids said, oh, you're going to be Florida man for a few days. Did and you I'm like, commit well, any wacky crimes? I did not commit any wacky crimes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give this laptop back to Octavia, who had gotten it out for me. Uh, and I'm going to tell everybody, so what oh. I'm signing today is different. It's very different. So a little while ago, my editor, Moshe, contacted us. Um, and if you don't know Moshe, he's the, you know, he's the person who discovered me and discovered Dan. Yep. Um, Love Moshe very much. He's a wonderful person, mostly retired now. You probably can't sell a book to him, but um, he contacts us and he says, uh, you know what I found, Brandon? I found the original manuscript of Elantris that you sent to me in 2001. Um, as a submission to me, it's just been sitting here. Do you, do you want this thing back? And I said, well, of course I want that thing back. That's a historical artifact. Uh, the, the submission that got me sold, um, Mm -hmm. and it came, it's very fun. It came in the original box that I sent it in. It has my original submission letter and everything like that. And thought, what am I going to do with this? This, this this, to be clear for you youngins. This was long enough ago, and it wasn't super long ago, but long enough mm-hmm. ago that we still had to mail printed manuscripts to people instead yep. of digital files. They wouldn't take a digital file. They wanted a printed manuscript to read and leaf through. Um, and the story is that uh, Moshe had sat on his desk for 18 months. Um, he took it home one night, and he finally read it. He read it in one night, he said, um, this very manuscript, and then tried to find me the next day. Um, though, uh, I was a little hard to get a hold of. I won't tell that story again. Just, you know, the early days of the internet, people weren't as easy to, to find. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I had moved since then and been 18 months, but regardless, this came, uh, and I thought, well, we're done signing way of Kings. I think, uh, there's, n- they have another thing for me, but I think I'm done with all the copies of way of Kings Leatherbound, uh, and they're getting ready uh, something else for me to sign. Um, they may actually be here for me once I finish this. Um, but I thought, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sign these and uh, I'm going to, um, you know, maybe frame them and I'm going to let fans, you know, buy them as pieces of art. Uh, I think they're yeah. kind of kind of cool. Um, I would like to, you know, like if they were the original manuscript of uh, going postal by... Uh, Terry Pratchett or something mm-hmm. that uh, someone had f- taken the pages and he'd sign them and frame them. Um, I think that would be cool. So the goal is to like put a little letter of authenticity explaining what it is. Maybe uh, as part of that, a copy of my an- initial submission, like the little oh, paragraph from my like uh, query letter. Query letter. Nice. Um, and then you know a little little seal of authenticity at the bottom, and then put a copy of the cover 
um, in nice, you know, high res, well printed uh, thing. So it's it's got a little bit of art feel to it. Um, and one of these together in uh, a little triptych frame and um, see if people want them. So I think that sounds great. Mm -hmm. So let me know if in the comments, if you think this is a, is actually a legit uh, cool idea. Um, because if, if people think it's cool, I'll try to dig out. I think I have um, a couple of other old manuscripts. Uh, I don't have everything because we, we moved to digitalist a second on that one. I'm going to put this underneath it because they're kind of in order, but not really. <laughs> um, this might just be easier for people. Nobody wants to buy a page that was stacked out of order. <laughs> um, I might be able to dig out some of the older books like Mistborn and, uh, and Original mm -hmm. Way of Kings. Like there's no uh, version of this really for like Oathbringer or some of the later books. What we do have are the, um, the copy edits. Mm-hmm. Um, but even copy edits are moving digital yeah. these days. So yeah, I mean, copy edits have been digital for a while. Yeah. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, we'll get uh, Mistborn, Way of Kings. I, I think I have Gathering Storm uh, Ooh, that was edited by Harriet that's fun. with actual editorial marks on it. Uh, this one doesn't have editorial marks because this is the original submission. Yeah. So the submission, um, the one that sold, not the one that got edited. Yeah, which I think is super cool and kind yeah. of uh, even a little more special. But mm -hmm. uh, some people might prefer the ones with little editorial marks on them and things like that. So I will, uh, I'll see if I can dig those out if people are interested. It might be nice to have like a Stormlight one, a Mistborn one, um, a Launtress, and then like a Gathering Storm mm -hmm. or a Memory of Light. Because Harriet, even after they went digital, she worked print. All analog. Huh? What would be wonderful is if I could find the page when I was on tour for Memory of Light. This is the last book of the Wheel of Time that I had to, um, on tour, do revisions on the plane in print form. Oh, wow. Because I needed to get the revisions in, but I was on tour for the previous book. And that was uh, that's when I'm like, really, we're not going to go to digital. We can't do this digitally. I have to shuffle these pages <laughs> on an airplane flight. Uh, they, fortunately, I was in business class. I wouldn't have been able to do that not in business class. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. anyway. That's awesome. So uh, I like let, to let think of know. whoever yeah. was sitting next to you was mm -hmm. some huge fantasy fan and realized what was happening. Next yeah, to them in the in this chair, sneaking your reading over my shoulder. Um, yeah, um, fans do uh, talk about that. I saw on Reddit <laughs> the, what people are like, "How do we get the seat behind Brandon purchased?" Um, because we know he writes on flights, so that we can watch what he's writing and kind of report to each other uh, about a uh, a chapter. So you're gonna have me looking well, over my not shoulder. Creepy at all. No, not at all. So, um, but anyway, uh, let me know. Let, if you guys have a better idea of how you would want these framed up, if you'd rather them not framed, you just buy the page by itself, let, let me know. Um, yeah. Just give me some feedback. Um, and we'll, we'll see if we can come up with, uh, with some of these things that, because uh, we eventually want to have a bookstore, right? Mm -hmm. a, a physical bookstore. I think this would be a cool item to have for sale in the bookstore. Yeah. And hanging in the bookstore. Yeah. One of the cooler pages. So here's a question for you on this. Okay. Um, because we do have a topic today, but... <laughs> Believe it or not. Page, the first page and last page. Should I do a special one that's like five? That's like, instead of a triptych, it's five things. It's like, you know, three on the top and two on the bottom or something mm. like that. That has page one and the last page. Title page and the end. Yeah. Sold together. Um or should should those be separate uh, separate things? Ooh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Put them together. I feel like you would have to charge an arm and a leg for them. That would probably be. Um, yeah. That would probably be true. But there's somebody out there who wants to spend an arm and a leg. Uh, <laughs> what? How much did Yumi? Um, the numbered edition of Yumi sell for? I don't know. Was that? I think I think it was fourteen. I think it was fourteen Ugh. grand. Yeah. Uh, granted, that's for charity. Mm -hmm. uh, people spend a little bit more with charity. Um, so, yeah. uh, but 14 grand for Yumi number three. Uh, and I think That's Yumi number four went for 10. Uh, so, um, so granted, again, people open their pocketbooks a little bit when they know it's going for to charity. be going to yeah. charity. Yeah. And these, so. these won't go for 14 grand. No, don't, these don't will worry not. about it. I will, yes. Now that we got you all excited, yes. <laughs> don't, 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 don't worry. worry. 
You're uh, not going to have to mortgage your house. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, what are we talking about today, Dan? All right, so uh, today we're going to talk about a thrilling heist, somewhat slightly less thrilling than throwing an alligator through a window, but yeah. right in that league. Right in that league, definitely. Uh, you and I went and saw the new Mission Impossible together. Together, we went and saw it Yay! so we could talk about it. Dan is like, we got to talk about this. Now we're like three, four <laughs> three weeks. Three or four weeks later. Um, it was really funny because we went with two of our friends who also work with the company, Isaac yep. and Scar. Mm-hmm. And uh, the four of us watched it and then came out of it. And the two of them were saying, that was so great. I loved it so much. And you and I looked at each other and said, Oh, that was a mess. (laughs) (laughs) We started immediately analyzing it. Uh, But let's not, uh, let's do non spoiler first. Yes. Non spoiler first. Um, We are going to talk about like what we thought of it, but non spoiler terms. Yeah. Uh, My rank, my rating was this is not as strong as uh, basically this is the weakest one since the two early weak ones. Yeah. Uh, I would probably rank this one. Um, I don't know. Where, where, how, how, two is the worst. Two just, is the worst. Just everyone agrees on that. I, yeah. Two's the one. It's, it's nice that it's such a big gap in quality though, because two is bad movie good, mm-hmm. right? Like, yeah. Two is get your friends together, watch it, um, and things like that. Uh, I actually personally think one is the next worst, even mm-hmm. though one is a good movie. It's, yeah. it's, it's over the fold from, it's not a, you know, you've got bad and you've got so bad it's good. Two's down here. Yeah. It's above that into good movie. The the placement of number one is going to mm-hmm. be the most controversial thing. Yeah. Because people either love it. Uh, there are people who think it's the best of the series because it's mm-hmm. much more of a spy thing it than is. an action movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, as I've said before, Mission Impossible is one of the only franchises I know of that just gets better and better with every installment. Three and then four and then five and six. They're just phenomenal. And I think that um one as the best is actually defensible. Like the others, other than two and now seven, the quality of the others is close. I agree with you in that. I would say mm-hmm. they get better starting with three all the way up uh to six. Um, but if you came in and said one is the best, I don't think that's a crazy take. Yeah. Uh, my favorite is, I believe, um, which is, this is, uh, well, try not, we can't give spoilers. Oh. Uh, it's either five or six. Um, I believe it's five. Yes, I know it's five. Five is my favorite. Five. Yes. Okay. I do think six is really good. And maybe if I, but I watched five and six back to back and I felt like I. Five, five is Rogue Nation. Yeah. And five had just a little bit more of little pieces coming together at the end mm-hmm. with, uh, with, in ways that I like, um, but six was more bombastic, and yeah. that's uh, that's definitely a thing. So anyway, I would rank seven below three. I would as well, uh, and I'm with you on five. I, as much as I do think that six, um, I think six is better mm. <laughs> than five, but five does have the best ending of any of them. Yeah. Just because of it all just suddenly the gears click into focus mm-hmm. and everything fits. Well, and, and it's five has so that smart prologue that matches the uh, the ending mm-hmm. in such a really cool uh snap together way. Anyway. Yeah. So it's it's really great. Uh six has you know, that I love six immensely, mm-hmm. but it ends with um a chase rather than a puzzle. Yep. Anyway. Uh, I would agree with you. Uh, Seven, Dead Reckoning Part One, Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it, but I felt like the quality of the writing, the quality of the storytelling took a big step back instead of a step forward. I would probably put it beneath one. And you don't like one as much. I So I have a weird relationship with one. When I first saw one, Disliked it immensely, mm-hmm. uh, which is odd. It's because I like the television show. Um, and spoilers for a movie that's this many years old. It's like 30 years old. Um, the It's not the television show. Um, it, like the television show is here's this team and all their specialties come together and they pull off something incredible, mm-hmm. an, an impossible mission. Yeah. And one was here's this team, they all get killed. <laughs> and now Ethan Hunt has to 
go rogue and figure out what's going on. Uh, yeah. And so it was not um, Mission Impossible to me. It was James Bond. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a big hurdle to get over. After I came back to it and knew what it was, I really liked it. I yeah. thought it was it, – it, it's like technically – on the all the technical mm-hmm. levels, just an excellent movie. It really is. Uh, it is, uh, ironically, far less James Bond than all the rest of them became. Yep. Um, and it does have. He does assemble a team, and they work together, and they do all the stuff. Yeah. Uh, the scene breaking into the computer in the white room is to this day iconic. Seven movies later, it's mm-hmm. one of the very best scenes the series has produced. Yep. Uh, so yeah, it's great. Uh, but there there were segments of Seven mm-hmm. that I thought were fantastic. And we're yes. being very spoiler-free. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are some that you've seen. If you've watched any of the trailers, I don't consider that a spoiler. Are we going to mention things that were yeah, in the trailers? Yeah, we can mention stuff in the trailers. Yeah, so uh, there's a scene that takes place in a train, which I thought was one of the most fun and clever action scenes that they've done. It was excellent. In a long time. Uh, and you can really feel the practicality of their set building um, mm-hmm. in that scene in a just amazing way. Yeah. Um, I will say uh, Haley Atwell as mm-hmm. a new addition to the cast. This is her first movie uh, with them. Yep. She was great. She hit it out of the park. And I've she loved really her since great. Agent Carter. She's yep. wonderful. Uh, and she really clicked for me well. Mm-hmm. Um, I would agree with that. Um, it has, it does a lot of things I love about the Mission Impossible series. Uh, mm-hmm. One of which being that the Mission Impossible series does not throw characters away generally as much as like James Bond. It's a hard reset. Even if some, there's some continuity of actors, they're almost playing a new version of themselves in every film, mm-hmm. even in these new ones. Um, and like uh, they've, and the new ones, they did a better job of this, the, the Daniel Craig ones. Yeah. But um, I've always disliked how James Bond just kind of ignores all of his history. Ignores all the previous movies. Yeah. And these ones don't. They really, they come back. They're relevant. Um, characters are relevant. Character mm-hmm. relationships are relevant. Um, and yeah. I really like that. Stuff that's happened in the previous movies matters. Yeah. Um, and it, honestly, in a way that the Daniel Craig Bonds have not done well, in my opinion, uh, trying to do things like uh, introducing Blofeld as a yep. big ongoing villain and just fell completely flat. And they haven't really done that with Mission Impossible. We haven't had yep. to deal with, okay, here's this same guy again. Uh, but all of the sidekicks and the supporting cast they keep coming back, and it's it's been a lot of fun. And it feels fun. like their characters evolve and things yeah. like that. Their so. characters evolve, the things that they have done, the things that mm-hmm. have been done to them, it all continues to matter. Well, and the, the biggest selling point of the entire franchise to me is that uh, Tom Cruise acts age kind of, I won't say appropriate, there's not a lot of 60-year-olds who mm-hmm. are able to do, but... He gets older and he feels older in every film. Yeah. Um, and the films lean into that. And so it's now this person who is, he's always been the underdog, which mm-hmm. James Bond never is. That's the biggest difference between yeah. these. And James Bond, James Bond is the favored to win any situation he's in. Even Daniel Craig, it's Bond. He's the coolest, he's the best. He's the, he, he yeah. will take it. And Ethan Hunt, it's always like, he is one step away from mm-hmm. utter disaster. He is always flying by the seat of his pants, yeah. making it up as he goes, scrambling against a far superior enemy. And yeah. we know he's going to win. Like, yeah. we're not saying that, you know, there's, there's never a moment in the movies where you think he's going to lose, uh, but he will lose fights, even if we know he's going to win the war eventually. And you, it's, they do the thing that, uh, Spielberg was so good with Indiana Jones. You see him flustered, mm-hmm. breathing deeply, worn out, broken in ways that, uh, again, Daniel Craig updated James Bond to really show some of this. Mm-hmm. But it's not a James Bond thing, um, yeah. right? Like, James Bond might need to catch a second wind. But James Bond isn't, I am too old for this. I shouldn't be here. 
Um, and beyond that, you often have Ethan Hunt just being panicked about the fact that he's going to fail, that his friends are yeah. going to die, that he's going to – it's its not holding together. Mm-hmm. But he he does, and that builds just enormous rooting interest. Yeah. we uh, We've talked before about – I think we have, uh, I know we have off camera, <laughs> mm-hmm. about how so many modern action movies uh, have this sense of invulnerability. Yeah. Uh, and Dwayne Johnson is is a big culprit for this, but mm-hmm. there's lots and lots of people who do I it. I mean, Marvel movies in general, like, I love the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, but, you know. Yeah. You could throw these guys through a wall, and they're like, oh, man. Mm, totally fine. I got uh, rubble in my eye. Dwayne Johnson actually has it in his modern contracts, very famously, that he doesn't lose on camera. He doesn't take hits. Um, you know, I remember going back and watching The Rundown, which was one of his very first starring movies, mm-hmm. and he he was... You know, he was getting beat up. He was losing. He was getting drugged. He was falling off of cliffs. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't happen to him anymore. It still happens to Ethan Hunt. And like you said, that sense of, oh, no, I'm in way over my head. There's no way I can solve this. Mm-hmm. He is. We get to see him be frightened. We get to see him be vulnerable. We get to see him be weak. And it seems like a weird thing to praise in an action hero. But this is something Jackie Chan has always talked about. Yep. That if you don't see him lose and get hurt, then you're not going to care when he wins. And they've absolutely embraced that with this series, and I think it's awesome. So, um, obviously, the kind of practical nature, the the Tom Cruise doing his own stunts, the building sets, um, all of this stuff uh, gives it um, a tactile sense that you don't get from a Marvel film. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really also elevates uh, these films. Yeah. They, they, they're served very well <laughs> by the set building and the stunt coordination and these sorts of things. Yeah. Well, and you touched on this earlier. Uh, this, is, this is the first time that I've really looked at Tom Cruise and thought, oh, he's getting old. Mm. He's been so careful with his image for so long. Um, I saw it in six. In six, he was really acting. Yeah. Um, but like, it, e- even in five, mm-hmm. you know, there's a scene where he is shirtless and totally ripped, and he like climbs up a pole upside down, and he flips yeah. off and does that. You don't see that anymore. Nope. Uh, there's a couple of shots where they didn't even like post production clean up the wrinkles in his mm-hmm. face because they're trying to show this is an old man who's getting to the end of his rope. So, uh, why do we give it a slightly lower rating without giving, going without into spoilers? spoilers? Without spoilers. Um, the dialogue was often awful. Uh, too expository. <laughs> Very expository. Uh, there were at least two, and I think three scenes that followed the exact same expositional structure in a way that was just jarring. Well, and that's, that's point number two of mine beyond the dialogue is... This there, nothing in this felt like something they hadn't done before better previously in the series, mm-hmm. and that's starting to feel like they're going to the same well too many times. Yeah. Um. So well, and this one had a layer of complication that felt unnecessary, mm-hmm. and to some extent, that is a hallmark of the Mission Impossible franchise that someone is going to be revealed as actually a hero in disguise or a traitor in disguise or they've yep. been a traitor all along or you know there's plans within plans and wheels within wheels and this is the one maybe it's been bad the whole time and I've just forgiven it but this is the one where I was like that was a completely unnecessary twist it changed nothing about the story except to make the movie 15 minutes longer yep um and I would say my third point is dealing with something that's in the title, part one. Mm. Uh, this feels much better than uh, some other movies, but it feels like setup. Uh, and so some of the weakness of it, it's, it's, it's odd because it's done very well for a part one. Yeah. Right? Uh, I would much rather some other part ones have done as good a job as this did, but it still, feel, still feels like a part one. And yeah. so it's hard to give my full um, 
love of this until I see how the payoffs happen, mm -hmm. which is different from kind of the ultimate part one uh, for me, which is um, Infinity War, mm. which Infinity War was a full movie for me. Uh, and then the payoff just was that much better. This, I think the payoff is going to determine how I view this movie in retrospect. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of things that feel like they might be sloppy storytelling or they mm -hmm. might just be set up that hasn't paid off yet. Yep. And so I am reserving judgment on those. There yep. are things that are absolutely just sloppy yes. storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do want to say to anyone who hasn't seen this yet, because we're still in the non-spoiler section, mm -hmm. um, it... I don't really consider it a cliffhanger. It's a part one. Yes. But it is telling a complete story. You get a satisfying resolution, even though there's obviously a bunch more story to tell. There's a bunch more story that's still good. Yeah, it's it's so it's weird, right? Because mm -hmm. it doesn't it is the way you want to do a part one. But we should move to spoilers because now we only have like ten minutes <laughs> left. Um we did a good job of non spoilers. So if you haven't seen the mm -hmm. movie, do go see it. It is good. Yes. Uh, it is uh, a, a solid thumbs up for me. This entire series, save for two, which is so bad, it is wonderful to watch. Um, <laughs> gets just a, a huge solid thumbs yeah. up. Um, same. I, I loved it while me, me saying that it's not as good as the recent ones, mm -hmm. not being as good as some of the best action movies in modern cinema. Yeah. Is not really a knock against it. So. All right. So spoiler terms now. It when Let's talk about that moment where we both looked at each other after the <laughs> film. And we both had the same main complaint. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we both started talking about it without even mentioning what the complaint was because it was so obvious to both of us. Yeah. We could discuss the problem and Scar and Isaac were just confused. Yeah, like what are you even talking about? And and we eventually realized oh they didn't they didn't see yeah. the thing. What was the thing? Well, they fridged a main character who's been in 3 films now mm -hmm. um who is an excellent character. Um and what's her name? Um, Ilsa Faust. Yeah, Ilsa. They fridged, Rebecca Ferguson. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson's character, while also introducing a character who is exactly the same, fills the same role, mm -hmm. uh, is recruited basically the same way, uh, with one little twist. Uh, the the new character is not um, as competent as Ilsa was. Ilsa started competent yeah. and was against him and had to be recruited in. And she was like a secret agent, um, you know, and double crossing him. And, and mm -hmm. uh, Agent Carter, uh, her name is... Um, uh, Haley Atwell. Haley Atwell's character is just a petty thief. Who gets embroiled in all of this? But I mean, a very competent thief. Yes. But yeah, she's, she's not a, a super thief. spy. Uh, and in some ways, what, one thing that I liked about this, which okay. we can touch on in passing, yeah. is uh, similar to some of the most recent Bond movies. This one was filled with little Easter egg nods to previous movies in the franchise, which was kind of fun. Yes. And one of those was the very first one where all of his team dies and he has to recruit a new one. They were at the time all criminals. And eventually some of them like Luther got, you know, mm -hmm. inducted in and they became yep. part of IMF. Uh, but it was nice to be kind of back to square one where Ethan is having to deal with a person he can't trust yeah. rather than a team that he trusts implicitly. But Ilsa for two movies was a person he couldn't trust who was kind yeah. of on the team. Who was kind of on the team, not but kind of not on one, the team. Kind of, but in the second one. And um, so I turned to Dan after this and I said, I said, that will work. I will forgive that if the reason is that um, that movie nine is going to be starring Haley and they didn't want to use Ilsa because she is too capable and competent mm -hmm. and they want to. Re or just they couldn't get Rebecca Ferguson. Yeah, or they Ferguson. couldn't get Rebecca Ferguson. They're like, we need someone new to carry the series. Um, I said, I wonder if she's younger. She's not, or they're around the same age. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need someone new to carry the series. My, if they do what I hope they do, which is put Tom Cruise, not kill his character, put him in charge of IMF, mm 
new director, new director of IMF to come in and do things occasionally. He gets to have like one action scene, a, uh, a film, uh, but mostly he's he's Tony Stark in the first uh, new Spider-Man film, right? Yeah. Where it's, it's all about Spider-Man, but Tony Stark's there kind of overseeing. Overseeing things. Kind of the role that Alec Baldwin had in four and yes, five. Right. Um, and if we can get him into that six. role, because yeah. he's in his 60s mm-hmm. and she's not that much younger. She's like 46 or something. Uh, but you you can do a new set of movies yeah. with him taking a sort of more patriarchal role um, over, you know, the team and have her be the star. I, I can understand having... Rebecca Ferguson exit if their characters are just too similar. Like they maybe they wrote this and they're like, Rebecca Ferguson, you're gonna do this, but it just doesn't work for whatever reason. They have to reintroduce the same character again and then kill yeah. off the one they'd done before. It was so clunky for it me. It was so weird. And mm-hmm. part of bringing in Haley Atwell as a brand new character is going yeah. to be recruited meant fabricating and retconning all of this new backstory into Ethan where he lost a recruit yeah. at some point in the past. And and it's just new stuff out of nowhere that really kind of works against the continuity we were talking about as such yeah. a good thing. It just did and not work. so it may very well just be that Rebecca Ferguson uh, has too many other things going mm-hmm. on and she couldn't carry the series forward and so they started twisting themselves into knots trying to set up this new story they're trying to set up. Or maybe they just want a new uh, a character, like I said, who is not as capable. Mm-hmm. So you can lean into that part of it. But I don't know. Um, yeah. If they do that, I will forgive some of this. Uh, but Well, and I that's mean, the key, right? Because the next one, Dead Reckoning Part 2, is really going to either pay this off or not pay it off, at which point, yes, this is all just sloppy storytelling because they screwed up, not because uh, uh, they were forced into it, uh, which is going to be weird. Uh, and so I don't really know yet how to think about it. Um, let me ask you, uh, because one thing that was a total surprise to me and and to other people that I've talked to uh, is the ultimate villain is an AI. Yeah. Uh, what, what are your thoughts there? It's fine. Um, neither here nor there. I mean, uh, we've had mm-hmm. our discussions about AI. The thing is, it's an AI, but it is filling the same role that you have in every Mission Impossible um, film of the person who knows what's going on mm-hmm. when the when Ethan doesn't yeah. and is pulling the strings. Um, and the AI is acting just like one of those people. Mm-hmm. Um. He is. Um, mm-hmm. It it felt very much to me like we got the prologue of Hunt for Red October. Yep. And then we got a really high action episode of Person of Interest. <laughs> uh, and that was basically what the movie was. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, another comment that we made after watching it is kind of the idea you said of going back to the well a few too many times because Ethan Hunt is always on the back foot. Mm-hmm. Because he is always scrambling to come up with a plan and save the day from mm-hmm. underdog position. The villains in every movie, at least from three on, have been very smarmy, smug, in control. And that makes sense because they are the foil to Ethan's yes. scrambling for power. Uh, but it's just starting to get old. They are And pretty- in this one, Gabriel... Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, I love the actor, uh, mm-hmm. Isai Morales. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, I am so tired of watching some smug jerk just stand there and say, oh, you thought you could defeat me, and then he escapes through some magical means. And I'm, I've seen that scene so many times already. And I'm also also pretty tired of IMF, we have to be rogue. I know. Like they, they go rogue from IMF every single every, time. I think it's it's got to be everyone <laughs> except like two maybe. Um like they they this this mm-hmm. organization is useless. Um and only Ethan Hunt yeah. is is worth anything. Uh but I mean and and this one 
oddly enough, was the first one that kind of addressed that directly mm -hmm. and kind of admitted out loud that IMF was just a giant mess and Ethan Hunt was the only reason it got anything done. Yep. Um, which maybe is on purpose because they're yeah. setting it up for him to become the new director. Right, but. and maybe they can then do three films um, yeah. with Haley that, it, that are, we don't have to go rogue. Mm -hmm. um, that would be pretty nice. They could feel pretty different. Yeah. Um, I will say this as we're winding down. Um, my least favorite part of the Mission Impossible films okay. is the fake faces. You don't like the fake faces. It's a staple of the films. It's a staple of the television show, but they use them in the films really awfully. Um, <laughs> they forget that they have a fake face-making machine so often. Um, they Ethan Hunt, they, these, these are just a terrible idea for the films they're making because there's no rules on them. No. And, you know, they break one in this one because they're like, oh, we can't have this. Um, See, four did the same thing. Yeah. Uh, four and now seven. Yeah. They have said, oh, no, the machine broke. And then they're still able to pull off whatever yeah. they did. Mm -hmm. In this one, they made one face instead of two. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yes, it's magic, but... It's not just magic. It's magic that we don't know the rules of and that they don't <laughs> use. Like in this one, there is a scene where he knows he's being hunted at the airport and mm -hmm. he goes in without a fake face on. Yeah. For no discernible reason, mm -hmm. he goes in without a fake face That's on. Yeah, they never explain why he can't use a fake face. And he should, we should never see Tom Cruise. If you have this machine... The only should always be somebody should else. Always be somebody else. You should never be wearing your own face. Mm -hmm. That's just co simple logic. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, the ironically, I do think the best use of the face machine mm -hmm. was in the second movie mm -hmm. when he puts a bad guy in a mask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that was very smart and fun. Uh, I did enjoy getting to see um, so much of Vanessa Kirby in this one uh, mm -hmm. because uh, because using the face machine, Haley Atwell disguised herself as her. Yep. Um, but yeah. Uh, so now that we're in non-spoiler territory, let me just quickly say. Oh, we are in spoiler. You mean? Now that we're in spoiler territory, yes. I can say uh, the sequence in the train Mm -hmm. uh, where the it's falling off of the bridge car by car, and they have to climb their way up through four or five of them. So cool. So well done. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. The car chase when they're in the little Fiat or whatever it is, it the, also the awesome. tiny little thing, absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually filmed in Rome and making use of its very weird streets and everything. Mm -hmm. um, it had so much to... Love the fact that that car chase takes place while they're handcuffed together, and so they, you know, going back to the idea that he he is panicked, he can't steer well, um, he doesn't know how he's going to get out of this because he's handcuffed to this thief that he can't trust and who doesn't trust him. Um, I really loved it. I just wish that it had made more sense, and I wish the <laughs> Ilsa death thing just hadn't yeah. happened like even how it played out for me uh scar liked it he's like it was a good death scar likes anything where someone is fighting to the end mm -hmm. um where it's like you're gonna have to choose between one of these two and then there's no way out of it like the determinism yeah placed on that feels antithetical to the way that mission impossible works and that mm -hmm. whole sequence i just had a pit in my stomach yeah because i knew what they were gonna do i'm like please don't do it um, and it ruined that whole sequence for me. Well, and I don't think it was a very good sequence to mm -hmm. begin with. Yeah. Um, because first of all, it's not a good death. Mm -hmm. uh, Ilsa Faust, who's the second best spy in the entire world, yep, uh, goes down like a chump to someone that untrained thief was able to beat in a knife fight. You said that. I didn't remember that. Did uh, So did Haley beat, what's his name? Um... Yes, I think he escaped. She lived through the fight at the very least, right? She did leave through the fight, but I don't feel like she beat She She Gabriel. didn't kill him, yeah. but she survived where Ilsa could not. Like, yeah. no one showed up to rescue her. Mm -hmm. um, and it just felt like 
so deterministic, so yeah. hand of the and, – and there was one really good thing in that sequence, which is Ethan Hunt being led the wrong way by the AI, mm-hmm. um, imitating yeah. uh, Charlie. Um, is that his name? Yeah. Uh, no, Simon Pegg plays – I Simon can't remember Pegg. his name. Simon Pegg. Yeah, uh, that was that was cool. That was fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and uh, I mean, arguably the the biggest whiff of the whole movie for me, at least, was uh, we introduced Carrie Elwes as mm-hmm. a very important character who means nothing and does nothing, and then it turns out that he's actually evil, and it doesn't matter, and then he dies immediately, and it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like you could cut him out of the movie entirely without losing anything. And so just why do we have all of this unnecessary complication? It's very weird and sloppy. I did love the scene where he infiltrates like mm-hmm. the chiefs of staff. Yeah. Uh when when you said that there was nothing in this that we haven't really seen before, that was the one scene that I thought. Is- yeah, I don't know if we've really seen that before. That's Breaking true. into his own government to interrogate somebody and then running off again. That was... I don't know. I feel like he's done that. I don't know. Maybe he I, has. I think he's had to break into it was, his... It was fun. But it was it was well done. Everything, like all the action sequences were executed very well. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that they made the bike jump the big thing because it was probably the hardest for Tom Cruise where it was the least spectacular for us visually compared you know, you know to- what I, You know what I learned today? Mm. They actually filmed that scene first, the very first thing of the entire movie. Okay. Because there was such a high risk of death that if he died, they didn't want to have to make the rest of the movie. So it either had to be first or last, and they made it first. And so I think that's a big part of why they've been pushing it so much. Because yep. it was the one where he as an actor most put his life on the line. Right. Which is cool. That's very, mm-hmm. you know, um not putting your life on the line being cool, but cool stunts, but it the the train sequence was by far the best action sequence. Oh yeah. Um and it's uh I'm actually glad it wasn't in the marketing material though because mm-hmm. I uh I yeah. got to enjoy it. I mean, I know that we knew they were on a train, but there, there's yeah. one shot in the trailer of a train like mm-hmm. jumping and every, all the China plates go flying. Yep. Uh, but since we're talking about the jump off the mountain, mm-hmm. we're over time. Um, you know, we he's they've left this gun on the mantle, so to speak, of we know Ethan Hunt is in a parachute coming to land on the train. Mm-hmm. And that's been hanging over our heads for a couple of scenes and then finally they have Haley Atwell at gunpoint and I thought oh please please don't save her life by having him fly in through a window on his parachute and then they did because that was the funny joke they could make even though it makes no sense (laughs) I just signed the last one of these and I wrote the end, because instead of writing the end, I used the three pound signs Ooh. from manuscript format, which means the end uh, in manuscript <laughs> format. So I wrote the end, um, put a little period on that, and uh, drew a little A on it. So, well, we'll figure out what to do yeah, with that. We'll do something um, with these. You know. But anyway, uh, there's Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Uh, part we'll be one. back in how, when's the next one? Oh, uh, next year it's supposed to be. Is it next year? Yeah. I I I I know the movie's underperforming, so I hope mm-hmm. nothing happens with that, but And and I will say at the end because mm-hmm. enough people have told me in the past month mm-hmm. that they just haven't been watching any Mission Impossible movies at all mm-hmm. that they are shocked that that's the one movie I would go see in a theater. Mm-hmm. Um if you haven't been watching Mission Impossible, please watch them yeah. because they're incredible. They really it's are. one of my favorite movie franchises of all time. Just, uh, just skip you know. two, start in three, and they're awesome. You can watch one though. One is good. One is very good. So, but yeah, I, I don't mean skip two of them. I mean skip yeah. number two, mm-hmm. and then go back and watch number two late at night when you're really tired and you've got a bunch of friends together because there's a scene where he walks through a door in slow motion and there's fire and doves fly in front of him. John Woo, mm-hmm. <laughs> how's that, Ben?